Welcome to For You Radio, where the gospel's for the believer and the unbeliever alike. That is you, me, and every child on God's green earth. I'm Craig D'Onofrio, pastor of Redeemer Lutheran Church in Wilmer, Minnesota. I almost forgot where I am. I'm, I'm a little under the weather, so I'm extra, extra special dopey and spacey today. So it should be, <laughs> should be a lot of fun, folks. Hang on. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is where like your grade school teacher would just pull out the uh, the video, right? So, like, <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Uh, I and am get uh, a little bit of mother's little helper <laughs> over here and get us through the show. Oh my! Wow, uh, I am Troy Near. I just happen to be pastor at St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Yes, indeed. Yes, I know. We are Thank happy. You. We're happy. We're just happy. Uh, also, to be part of 1517.org's podcast network, go check out 1517.org. Wonderful stuff over there. 40 Minutes in the Old Testament with Chad Bird. If you have not been listening to that podcast, you're just ripping yourself off. And uh, you should be ashamed of yourself for not listening to that, really. <clears throat> I mean, you, you should be listening to 40 40 minutes in the old. Did I say 40 seconds in the old Testament? No, you totally said 40 minutes. You're okay. Okay, okay. good, good, good. Yeah. I need some more cough medicine. I think that'll help. Uh, (laughs) So go check out that 30 minutes in the new Testament is the other one. And, uh, Oh, faith and reason exchange. If you're really feeling a little pointy headed, you can listen to Adam Francisco and Dave Anderson, doctors, both, and all sorts of great, great stuff over at 1517. As a matter of fact, if you're home and ill and you just are looking for a way to fill out your 24-hour day, you can, you'll have no problems. Just listen to podcasts all day from 1517. You'll be fine. Okay, uh, that, Troy, that, if people wanted to email us, what would they type into their email machines? Well, you are most certainly still invited to email us. We'd love to hear from you, uh, prayer requests, comments, uh, even just, uh, you know, hey, an occasional you know, chocolate chip cookie recipe. I haven't asked for that for a long time. So mm, yeah. if you got a good chocolate chip cookie recipe, I want it. Uh, and uh, that would be uh, oh, oh, uh, for you radio at 1517.or and a G at the final end of it there. O-R and or G. Very good. Yeah, probably just .org. We are, dot org. <laughs> yes. We're working our way through Dr. Rod Rosenblatt's uh, Gospel for Those Broken by the Church, a wonderful lecture. You can go on YouTube and just type that in there, the Gospel for Those Broken by the Church. There are all sorts of different versions available out there, and yet all the same lecture. We're listening to the one that was recorded at Faith Lutheran Church in Capistrano Beach some years ago. A wonderful lecture and uh, one that has been very instrumental in converting a lot of people from, uh, well, I'm going to say burned out Christian faith into a vibrant Christian faith, one that finds a lot of comfort in the gospel. Uh, If you're a person who has been kind of of the feeling of been there, tried that, really attempted to be a good Christian and couldn't, and uh, if you're like me and you came to a place where you, you kind of felt like God hates you because you've tried and tried and tried and he didn't give you the ability to live that victorious Christian life, I got good news for you. Jesus did it for you. And that's what Rod is going to tell you today. And he's going to keep telling you, you this until hopefully, finally, you'll believe it even as I finally did too. And well, uh, we're going to jump right back in. We're, we've been talking about the sad ones. I think we're going to get into mm-hmm. the mad ones. Or do I have that backwards? No, we're going to come back with the sad ones. Uh, and just picking up on what you just said, these people who are saddened by the church, uh, they're not disappointed in the church. They don't find a lot of hypocrisy in the church. They're saddened because they don't feel like they can fit in. Um, right. These are the people who... I'm going to say, take their faith very, very, very seriously and realize that they don't measure up. Uh, And their church has been telling them that they ought to. Right. And so finally, uh, as you just said, the whole thing comes crashing down where you think, ah, clearly I'm not a good enough person to be in the church. And that's uh, that's where Rod comes in today. Are we ready? Yeah, let's do this. All right, and here goes. 
What the sad alumni of Christianity need to hear, perhaps for the first time, is that Christian failures are going to walk into heaven, be welcomed into heaven, leap into heaven like a calf leaping out of its stall, laughing and laughing as if it's all too good to be true. It isn't just that we failures will get in, it's that we will probably get in like that. We failures in living the Christian life as described in the Bible will probably say something like, you mean it was really all that simple? Just Christ's cross and blood? Just his righteousness imputed to my account as if mine? You've got to be kidding. And all of heaven is ours just because of what was done by Jesus outside of me on the cross, not because of what Christ ever did in me, in my heart, in my Christian living, in my behavior? Well, I'll be damned. But of course, that's just the point, isn't it? As a believer in Jesus, you won't be damned. No believer in Jesus will be, not a single one. As C.S. Lewis put it, there are going to be a lot of surprises at the eschaton. There are going to be people there that we just don't imagine will be there. Think of the non-Israelite that C.S. Lewis purposely put in heaven at the end of his The Last Battle. Boy, did that ever get the goat of some Christians. But you read what Aslan said to him. I suppose you're wondering why you're here. Answer, yes, sir. And then he tells him why. There are going to be believers in Jesus who never darkened the door of a church. That's no encouragement not to attend, not to be baptized, not to receive the Lord's Supper. It's just saying that faith in Jesus saves. Saves all by itself, nude, apart from works. There are going to be scads of Roman Catholics, people who never listened really to the theology preached by their priests, but just believed in the sufficiency of Jesus' blood, no matter what the priest was preaching. People of all sorts who just believed in Jesus and his blood shed for them, for complete payment of all of their sin. There are going to be call girls, there are going to be drug dealers, maybe even a couple of lawyers. <clears throat> there are going to be members of the cult who never really got what the cult leaders taught, but just trusted that Jesus' blood and cross was for their sin and for their hatred of God, for their wickedness. Surprises. Lots of surprises. It bugs me to say it, but there might even be a couple of IRS employees, <laughs> maybe a congressman or congresswoman. Everyone has some class of people they really don't want to die as believers in Jesus. Those are mine. <laughs> but to put it closer to home, there might even be a theologian or two who believed in Jesus. <laughs> Bet the blue chips on the blood of Jesus and nothing else or in addition to that blood. There might even be a despicable leftist socialist college professor or two, academics who daily sold out the wonderful American Constitution and instead filled their students' heads with status drivel and mush. Cowards, scum, bottom of the barrel, reprehensibles, jerks, deadbeat dads, murderers, all sorts of rabble. And they died believing in Jesus and his blood as their only hope. Ask yourself, is sola fide true or is sola fide not true in the case of failing Christians? Is Paul's letter to the Galatians true or no? And if Galatians is true, and it most certainly is, but an apologia for that is not our subject today, can a failing Christian be saved simply by the cross and blood of Christ? Or can he or she not be so saved just by Christ's blood? If you answer yes, he or she can, well, that's the message that's gotten lost on most Jack Christians, at least the ones I've met. Many times the law has already ready done its work on them. Boy, has it ever done its work on them. They need more law like they need a hole in the head. The law was and is killing them. True, Paul says, the law kills. He writes as if that is what the law is for. The law is designed to crush, to crush human pride and supposed self-sufficiency toward God. It is intended to kill, designed to kill. 
The biblical connection is law-sin. What gives sin its power is the law. And more so, the law is designed to make the problem worse. It is to be gasoline on an already blazing fire. Want to have sin run out of control? Go to a church in which the law is preached, and then the law is preached again and more stringently and deeply, and then the law is preached even more. Think of John Lithgow's portrayal years ago of a law-preaching pastor in the film Footloose. Didn't you just cringe? I mean, even if you're a Southern Baptist, you had to cringe at that character. Drawing the Christian line in the sand at the possibility of a high school dance? Lithgow could not listen to his daughter, even if hearing her would have instantly resulted in world peace. Man, was he righteous. In Footloose, Lithgow's wife should have been the pastor. Don't quote me. I could be thrown out of the Missouri Center for even joking about such a thing. You Missouri Lutherans, that's a joke. <laughs> Chill out. Or as Phil Hendry says in the ad, it wouldn't hurt you to laugh. You non-Lutherans, all of this is an inside joke. Ask your Lutheran friends why that's a joke in our circles. My point, though, is that the whole film Footloose was Jesusless. No cross, no atonement, nothing of Christianity really. Same as chariots of fire, completely Christless, completely gospelless. Back to the point. For many of the Jack Christians we've met, the law is all their ears ever heard. For them, the gospel often got lost in a whole bunch of Christian life preaching, and it did them in. And so they left. And deep down, there's a sadness in these people that defies description. If you and I don't understand, understand that, we should. They were crestfallen, so great their hopes and so devastating the failure. C.F.W. Walther said uh, that as soon as the law has done its crushing work, the gospel is to be instantly preached or said to such a man or woman. Instantly. Walther said that in the very moment that the pastor senses that the law has done its killing work, he is to placard Christ and his cross in his blood to the trembling, the despairing, and the broken. Be of good cheer, my son, your sins are forgiven. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Fear not, little flock, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. And he, when he comes, will neither break the bruised reed nor quench the smoldering wick. When you come back, when you return, remember me. I tell you this day you shall be with me in paradise. It is finished. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that faith not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And to the man who does not work, but trusts the one who justifies wicked people, his, his faith is counted as if it were righteousness. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. But now a righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so forth. Secondly, let's talk about those alumni of Christianity who are not sad but mad. It's not all that uncommon. 
I find that these angry ones have usually not switched from Christianity to another religion, nor have I found that they have switched from one Christian denomination to another. Instead, I find that they are angry at any and all religions and anyone who represents any religious, religious position, but especially Christianity. And that is natural. After all, it was Christianity as they see it that used them up and threw them away. I suppose the most visible examples would be men like the late comedian Sam Kinison and ex-Roman Catholic George Carlin. You may and probably do know better contemporary examples than I. All of us are in the vicinity of people like this at one time or another, maybe know a few of them, or have at least met one or two in passing. Why do I say that? Because such people are, as I said, not all that uncommon these days. Now, I certainly can't this morning exhaust the dynamic involved in such people. Again, I'm no clinical psychologist. But I still think a lot of the mad alumni also often have a nameable history, just as the sad alumni have one. People like this often speak as if Christianity baited and switched them, just like a used car salesman baits and switches a young couple at a car lot. Christians promised them a new life in Christ in such a way that it was going to be a life of victory, God's designed route to earthly happiness, a new divine power that would solve the problems so obsessing them. Then, when the promises didn't seem to work the way they were supposed to, the church put it back on these believers that they were somehow not doing it right. They weren't reading their Bibles enough, they weren't praying enough or praying right. They weren't attending enough church meetings. They weren't making right use of the fellowship. You name the prescription. You fill in the blanks any way you want to. Some pastor or layman told them that Christianity was failing them because they weren't doing it right. And often these believers took that counsel to heart and set themselves to trying to do it better or do it right so that it would work. But again, Christianity seemed not to deliver on its promises. It didn't work. As they see it, they gave it every shot, and Christianity failed to deliver. And then they were called guilty for not doing it right to boot. These people feel not just disappointed, they feel betrayed. They feel conned, and they are deeply angry about it. Or take another example. Those who heard much of Christ and his saving blood or cross in an evangelistic meeting and became Christians, and then heard very little of that wonderful message in the week-by-week -week pulpit ministries of their congregations. Instead, they heard recipes as to how to conquer sin over and over and over and over. These people also often give up on Christianity and they are angry about it, really angry. And I don't blame them, really, nor should you. The church has an obligation to preach the gospel to these people on a weekly basis, and deep down they somehow know that. But if that isn't what happens, they react, and I would too. After all, what does the church have for a man, a woman, a child, other than Christ and his work on their behalf? Not much. Not compared to being absolved, not compared to eating the body of Christ given into death for their sin and drinking the blood of Christ shed for their sin, not compared to the gospel of Christ crucified for them and for their sin, Christ risen from the dead for their justification. Is there anything we can do that is of genuine help to such angry alumni of Christianity? I think so. And the answer I'm about to give you comes right from a guy close to one of those angry ones. From whom? From Cam Sam Kinison's brother. How so? One night, years ago, I happened to be watching a 60 Minutes interview with Kinison's brother. After Sam was killed in an auto accident on some highway near Las Vegas, he describes that as he, uh, his brother lay dying, he was cradling Sam's head in his arms. The interviewer asked Sam's brother about Sam's hatred of Christianity. 
And his brother looked at the interviewer and said, what? You think Sam was not a Christian believer? You're wrong. Sam died as a believer in Jesus Christ. You'll definitely see Sam in heaven. You see, Sam was never angry with Jesus. He was angry at the church. And I jumped out of my chair and I yelled, that's it, there it is. There's the answer from Sam Kinison's brother. What did I mean, that's it? We can respond to the angry and say something like, oh, I see, you're not angry at Jesus Christ, you're angry at the church. Boy, oh boy, join the club. So am I, and so are a whole bunch of other Christians too. Now, this response takes more than a few minutes of thought on our part. That is, am I ready to say such a thing? And that's not an easy question. For many of us, especially us clergy, given the predictable profile of the clergy with their close relationship with their mothers and not with their fathers, this question can be really difficult. For most of us pastors, the link between Jesus and the church, a mother symbol, is so tight, so identical, that to be angry with Mother Church is the same as being angry with Jesus. But I'm recommending, at least in conversations with the angry, that we, all of us, identify with the anger of these people at the church, that we say, well, of course you are. I just thought you were angry with Christ. Now, I know that's tough. Again, it raises questions in us that are not easy ones particularly for us pastors who are closer to mom than to dad. And unfortunately, that's most of us. But I recommend we take the hit. It's not unlike the case with something like the Crusades or the Inquisition. I think most of us don't want to defend everything the church has done in the past. And believe me, the angry alumni are listening closely to see whether we're going to defend the church as much as we defend the gospel. I recommend that we do not defend the church as much as we defend the gospel. I recommend that we immediately cop to the horrendous things done by the church in the past. And for those of you who are Lutheran, this is not the time to catechize this guy into the finer points of Luther's two kingdoms theory. Let me I'm going to pause there because we've gone quite a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, I am repeatedly struck by um, by how Rod kind of circles around this the same issue time and time and time again, uh, and that is fundamentally uh, the the uh, the t distinction between law and gospel, and the uh, the mixing the blending of those two. Uh, so yeah, so we've mm -hmm. we've got to back up a little bit to get to that. Um, but I, I do also want to touch on what he was just talking about with the church and uh, the difference between the institution of the church and the gospel itself. But let's do go back to law and gospel because he, he nailed that pretty hard uh, as he was talking about the imputation of righteousness versus behavior. And it's, it's not our behavior that our, our Christianity is based on. It's Christ perfect righteousness credited to our account. We talked about this on the last episode, that we have a grace-based faith apart from our works. And, and so, you know, we, we have to grapple with Romans and Paul uh, versus James. And so we, we look at Romans uh, 3, verse 28, where we find that one is justified apart from works of the law. And James 2, where James points us toward our works. And of course, we have to understand that James is writing toward those who are already Christians. And Paul is writing in a context of how we are saved initially. So James is saying, well, you who are Christians, if you're acting like pagans, uh, I'm not seeing your faith here. Uh, but you are not saved by doing those good works, but we aren't going to uh, keep acting like pagans once we're saved, right? So we have that. And then now we're saved, we still live with this law gospel paradigm that you're talking about, Troy. And I'll, I'll let you go on from there, but I just kind of wanted to set the stage with that. Yeah, and, and so this is it's just really important to me because this idea of law and gospel is something that has been messed up so many times by so many people. You know what, myself included. Uh, Martin Luther would like to, he, he would like to remind us that 
uh, anyone who can like nail this law gospel thing, get that proper distinction all the time, boy, oh boy, he is a doctor of the church and give him all sort of letters and everything else like that uh, because this is a tricky thing to master. So uh, even though I might sound accusatory here in just a hot minute, I understand that this is a challenge. And what we're coming up against right here is this idea of what is the law and what is the gospel. Uh, Simply put, whatever in the scriptures we see uh, God giving a command or making a demand, that is God's law. Whenever we see him giving a promise, uh, a promise that is completely made from his grace uh, and there's nothing attached to that, that is gospel. And that finds us, both of those, find it, by the way, find its fruition, uh, its fullness in Christ on his cross, where law and gospel just meet. Uh, the, the wrath of God and the grace of God both shown forth at the same time. Mm. But mm-hmm. uh, for you and I, we come back to this idea of what the law is, what it does, and what God intends for it to do. And Rod said something, I think, highly provocative, but very good. He said the law is intended to kill. The law is intended to crush. It is there that um, in the primary theological use of this law, the God's law is there to remind you that you are indeed a sinner and you by yourself are unworthy and you better just get off your high horse because you've got nothing that you can be proud about. Hmm. And that, although it sounds so hard to accept, is a beautiful and amazing thing. Because when we finally come to grips with that, when we finally come to this idea that, okay, I I can't take the law and make myself a better person. I can't take the law and make myself more pleasing to God. I cannot even take the law and use it to measure how righteous I am. But every time we look at the law, we say, oh, I see, I'm a sinner. And that becomes an amazing thing because then we realize, I bring nothing to God. I bring nothing to God, and yet he gives everything to me. And that is the gospel part. That idea that he gives and gives freely, uh, even though I know that I continue to sin against him. Uh, and and there, there's that law of gospel. And, and when churches mess this up, when they mix this up, when they confuse these two things, when they say, okay, yeah, you're saved, but now you've got to act like it. You're, you're saved, but now you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to do that. And the truly righteous Christian will be one who does such and such. Uh, you know, i mm, I, I got to tell you, uh, <laughs> I think it's a great thing to read your Bible and pray in the morning. I think it's fantastic. But I can also tell you, I've been worn down by how many preachers tell me I've got to do that each and every morning, or otherwise, I'm just not close to Christ. Right, right. Uh, This gives people the impression that the gospel is for the unbeliever, but not for the believer. That uh, now that you're saved, here's what you need to be doing and this is what saved people do. And if you're not doing these things, then I don't think you're saved. And this is James 2 taken poorly, James 2 taken badly. Um, instead of us leaning on the grace of Christ and seeing that he is doing these works in us, we're throwing the works back on ourselves, saying, I have to do this or else, instead of saying, this is Christ working through me. Uh, so we, we take the law as an imperative, as something that I must do in order to be saved, instead of this is what Christ is doing in me. Uh, look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, it is work of God. But verse 10 talks about we're saved unto the good works that he has prepared beforehand for us to do. It is God who has prepared the good works and he who does them through us. And it's not us who do them. It's God who does them. And so we're simply just a tool in his, in his toolbox, and uh, he uses them. Rod points out that the law kills, the law demands. Uh, Lex Semper Accusa, the law always accuses us. Not only 
but always accuses us. Latin alert right there. And this is, <laughs> this is what the law does. It accuses us. And it sends us scurrying back to the gospel. It sends us scurrying back to the place where we know that we can find refuge, even as Christians, and especially as Christians, we know we can run back to Christ, our big brother. Uh, when we don't know that, then we go from being the sad to the mad that Rod talks about, and that's our bad religion. And, it, and this is where we end up in that place of despair where we hear, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it sincerely enough. You're not doing it righteously enough. You're not doing it good enough. You're not enough. And then we end up in a place where we just either quit or despair or we con ourselves into thinking we are doing it right. Yeah. And, and we end up in all sorts of trouble. You know, I, in a real bizarre way, I mean, and that, this is kind of the idea I was just playing around with a few minutes ago. Um, I want to encourage pastors to tell people that. You're not doing it right. You're not sincere enough. You're not true enough. You're not righteous enough. You don't do enough for God. And nevertheless, he saves you. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what I want to yeah. hear. You know, and what I what I when I go to a church and I hear that message, I am uplifted. When I go to a church and I hear pastor tell me what I ought to do and he never gets around to the gospel. That was a Christless message. If there's I'm no God, I'm trying to think yeah. of who, who I can't remember if it was Augustine or who it was that talks about Hosea, and and he, he talks about how the church, you know, the Hosea is a picture of a man who ends up marrying a very loose woman on the command of God, and this is a picture of God's relationship with Israel, and that translates to God's relationship with the church, basically. And, and he basically says, and Rod loved this statement so much, he used to say it all the time, the, the church is your mother and the church is a whore. Oh. <laughs> and that hurts. I mean, that really hurts to hear that. And that, that wrangles. I mean, that ruffles your feathers a lot. But that's God's relationship with his bride. And, and we are unfaithful to God over and over again. And, and this is where the mad ones come in. Because we see that the unfaithfulness, the, the, the bad behavior in the church, uh, from the church council sometimes to the church bureaucrats to all sorts of different places, the church gone wrong, and the anger that comes with that. And we dare not say that this is God's doing, but this is sinners involved in God's church. And these are people who need to flee to Christ every day, just like you and I. So we need not think that we are any better or worse than those people, because we are those people. Uh, we are every bit as bad as Gomer, uh, and we are every bit as fallen as those people. And we are those people. Uh, so lest we get on our high horses and think that, well, if I were in charge, it, we'd bring our sin just as much as they do. And uh, uh, So we, we would create the mad ones as well. <laughs> and, and a word to pastors, right? please. A word to pastors. Yep. Uh, pastors, you know, uh, Craig and I, we're one of you. Uh, we understand very deeply the need, the desire uh, that, that you want to see your people grow in Christ. You want to see them mature in the faith. You want to see them hearkening to the Lord. You want to hear them uh, and see them growing in the Word. You want to see that fruitfulness in their lives. I understand that. I understand that deeply. But you don't get that by hammering them with the law. The only way the yeah. church grows, the only way people grow, is through the gospel that gives life. Um, we think about Jesus' parable of the sower, and he sows the, this reckless seed just everywhere. Uh, and there's so many different types of seed that spring up and is choked off or just becomes fruitless. But the one type of seed that remains and grows and produces fruit is the seed of just simple, humble faith that trusts in Christ to receive everything from him. That is the faith that brings about innumerable 
rewards, innumerable fruits. And that's what I'd like to see you preach, guys. That's what I'd like. Amen. All right. Amen. I just want to point this out, that uh, as Martin Luther died, uh, it's, it's said that in his pocket was a piece of paper. And apparently this were, was basically his parting thought, was we are, are all beggars. This is true. Mm. Uh, we, we bring nothing. Uh, but we are given to by a gracious God. If that was the last thoughts of a great, great theologian like Martin Luther, I think that is what we should want to leave with our people as well, just as Troy was saying. Yep. And I think with that, we should wrap up this program. So until next time, go in peace, be an empty hand beggar, and receive a bounty from your Lord. Amen. For You Radio is a 1517.org production. To listen to this radio broadcast and podcasts and broadcasts like this one, I invite you to visit 1517.org. There you will also find many publications and free resources, including classes on Christian apologetics, church history, philosophy, and so much more. We are completely funded by generous donors like you. Would you consider making a generous gift to our work of spreading the gospel? Simply visit 1517.org.